I did decide to want to place my sort of thinking that I do with the phone, which I think is what I would call it, within the realm of my greater practice, because I sort of doesn't, I don't think it sort of makes sense to me to kind of see them all apart from each other, because they're all about acts of thinking at the end of the day. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few um, kind of works that are, I work, whoops, I work very long form uh, in my sort of other practice. Uh, you know, um, it's a it's a film based practice. It's analog, um, and it engages with issues over a long period of time. So sometimes greater issues, sometimes smaller issues. So I'll show you a few of those, and then I'll I'll sort of waltz into the more uh, phone related uh, works. Um, so when I first uh, began sort of studying photography, I was I was very interested in working in and with the world from the beginning. But I knew um. Uh, and so, you know, in this kind of, uh, this idea of the documentary um, practice. But I mean, I, I was thinking a lot about like, okay, what does that, what does that mean? So how can I enable myself to, um, to be able to um, tell someone else's stories um, and, and do that and, and sort of do that, um, do it justice, I suppose. And what does that mean? And what does this idea of um, sort of um, the ethics of representation and who's doing the looking, um, what does that mean? So I knew I, I sort of, to me, uh, to me to be able to sort of um, walk into a practice that had that at its bottom, it only made sense by um, starting um, around myself and starting on my own uh, narrative, I suppose, and documenting my family and my own sociality. Um, and looking really closely at like what was in immediacy around me, which is still very underlying a part of my practice anyway. It always has to do with, with the things that are that are in my life around me. Um, so this this family work um, is probably it's called Nia, and I, I did it. It's probably still to date like sort of my longest uh, work, which spans over like ten years or something. Um, and it's of course family work is always a sort of collaborative act as well. Actually, Anna, there you have it. <laughs> um, um, uh, so it's very much about intimacy and nearness, and I think the camera for me has always been a, a tool uh, to to draw closer in a way. It never makes me feel distanced from anything, actually. Um, it makes me feel the opposite. Um, I think it's almost an act of love, even though it sounds a little bit tacky, but I, I feel it like that. Um, so this family work is about the structures and the changes in relationship and love and patterns and distance and aging as we're spread all across the globe. But it's very much about um, sort of patterns of and rituals of the everyday as well, and sort of like the repetitions of the everyday. Um, and I mean, this was in like, you know, I began, I began this work in 2004 when I was studying. Um, and I think because we're all spread out across the globe, um, uh, which is also, which of course is a huge part of this work and still is, um, I was always trying to, and so, you know, I was photographing in Australia and in South Africa and in Germany and in New Zealand and I don't know, like, and, you know, of course, which also go through seasonal, different seasonal states, um, uh, you know, um, opposite to each other. So I was trying to sort of see how through um, creating visual dialogues, I could find patterns within the family that would sort of connect it through across the continents through sort of gestures or routines that were um, that were shared somehow simultaneously somehow. And um, um, in a way, it is definitely an att attempt to um, explode geography in a sense. Anna, you said this really beautifully yesterday as well. You spoke of like um, imagined geographies, which um, which really resonates with me. Um, so it's a kind of personal unmapping of the world in a sense that divided us, my family and I, and it creates a space that sits outside of the borders um, that are between us. Uh, um, so another work that I was making over some years also something again extremely personal and close to me is um, uh, Chris, who was part of my family um, in 2010 at the age of 29, uh, lost his fight with depression. Um, and. I knew that as uh, sort of, you know, in the family and there's a lot of silence around the suicide, right, and um, it's a taboo thing to talk about, which I don't agree with because I think we, we ought to share our wounds much more, but so I knew also with I didn't want that silence and I didn't want him to be a statistic, but also like within the family because we were speaking a lot about this um, and about his exit, um, I knew that I was the one that was sort of equipped with the language of, or like the toolkit of communications. I had to, I sort of had to make a work with this, um, which is really about um, connection between loss and ritual and memory. I suppose it has three interchangeable chapters visually. Um, 
um, another work that also lasted for a long time, uh, went on for a long time, it grew out of me and it follows on from the family narrative still. It is still about the family, um, but I'm no longer really interested in showing the family as it is or describing what we look like or whatever, but I'm rather really interested in this idea of, um, and sorry if it's a bit dark on the screen, this idea of uh, the space between us, you know, um, the space that sort of keeps us apart from each other. So the world really, um, uh, and this distance, and what does that feel like? And to sort of um, also in my head try and sort of um, fill that distance with stuff, animals, birds, you know, and all kinds of things. Um, and I was interested in distance as a, as a place, actually, because I think it's very real and we all know what it feels like. It's almost our new locality globally, isn't it? We all know what it feels like. Um, but it's also, in, in a way, it also proposes something that is almost imagined because it assumes a less bodied reality, I suppose. It's not like the chair in the room. Um, so I, I'm interested in, like, always interested in, in photography and this idea of what kind of counter language can it offer? Can it, can it offer a counter language? And, you know, um, um, and uh, to create these sort of uh, emotional truths, uh, you know, or, 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 a, or a sort of um, the truth of a, of a lived experience, I suppose. Um, Uh, so this is the last one that I'll show you before I launch into the other stuff. This is something, um, it's still actually very new, um, I started it last year and I'm just about to fly back and uh, install it in Melbourne for the first time, which is really exciting. Um, this is just a snippet, but so it follows on from my kind of very, very long, um, sort of decade long already engagement with <coughs> ideas of uh, sustainability, uh, climate change, uh, human impact um, and ecologies and particularly in Australia. Um, and so this work is called Swell. Um, and again, I'm interested in this idea of sort of thinking about um, talking to our times and um, ecologies, but also in a, in a kind of like trying to find a counter language. And like, how can I do that with, in a way that sits outside of a sort of disaster capitalist um, visuality, I suppose. And rather, rather really trying to, or what I'm trying to sort of do is actually to, to to build a posit more, sort of more of a positive ecological imaginary, I suppose. Um, uh, very interested with this work and these ideas of, like, I'm thinking a lot about, like, this sort of idea of a mini ecology, so, like, these kind of small spaces um, uh, that are shared by all kinds of things, beings, really, and, and how, like, this sort of idea of interconnectivity within that and looking at, like, um, kind of bringing making pictures that bring things together rather than pulling them apart, I suppose, and looking at how work, things work together within a small space. Um, it's really also perhaps like a smashing down of the idea that nature is the other, um, because I don't believe that that is, I think there is only us as a togetherness, actually. Um, so the phone dropped into my life in like 2013, I suppose. Oh, well, I mean, the idea of the camera on the phone. Um, and it all began, like I think I said earlier in the talk, with a piece of rubbish that I saw and that was sort of just um, glowing. Um, I'm not going to name the brand that it was, but and it was glowing and it was sort of an incredible moment because I kind of looked at it and, and I didn't have my other camera and I only had the phone. So I made a picture and I just, it was just flat falling to pieces and glowing and strange, and um, uh, which, which I loved. Um, and I joined Instagram at that point as well. And you know, like, of course I didn't have, I mean, I had no followers. Like, I was just very curious about what this thing is and what the phone is and what one can do with it. Um, and because of my sort of more long form practice or like this, you know, the very slow film based or bigger issues sort of thing, this Instagram and this phone thing really offered a space in which I kind of found myself, wow, I could just do anything, whatever doesn't matter. I don't know. I kind of felt like, wow, I can experiment. I can play. I can push it. I can push myself. I can, um, um, I loved that it was so small and immediate and that it fed into my um, obsession with the vernacular or the quotidian. Also the gutter, which I do believe tells an awful truth about us always, actually. Um, I loved its limitation from the start very much um, because I f almost feel like within that limitation, um, and it's getting better, of course, but it's still limited, but particularly in the beginning, Within this limitation, um, pushing that limitation, I felt like I could bear witness to the medium almost like falling in on itself uh, and, and giving up and morphing, morphing and shifting and losing the fight and becoming something else. Um, Instagram was particularly attractive to me from the start that about this idea that there was no longer a middleman, right? <laughs> um, which is a tremendous uh, 
it's very amazing actually in fact that you could just you could make something and then you know you could feed it straight to the horse's mouth if the horse was around in that sense uh, I suppose so I was kind of found myself using the phone and I just like really um, it's very much about the act of it somehow the, the active the, the action um, um, it was almost it, I feel it more like it wasn't not so much that the picture it wasn't really about the picture having to look a certain way or be something or, or like it wasn't really or even certainly not end up anywhere it was more about really the act itself because it felt like it was a sort of a being in or a belonging to like a place an era a time a moment a street etc um, and so I would perform these um, I would perform these strange things uh, I, I would call them restless acts somehow and I would have hashtags that denoted actions because they asked me to sort of do something with the world around me as well like um, rubbish on my way to work for which I um, would collect rubbish and then photograph it or uh, depends on how you look at it which um, and so there's these kind of strange um, things, these actions that I performed, I suppose, and did to make these pictures. And in a way, what I loved about it too was that um, I felt that there was no longer a kind of hierarchy of subject matter as I was starting this, because uh, it sort of it was. I felt like it was democratizing the way that I was looking at the world around around myself, and everything sort of mattered. Um, I do really weird things, you know, like, uh, I mean, this is probably a little bit embarrassing, but that's fine. Um, but I would just do stuff, like, and this is years ago when I was first playing with this, but I, w I would just sort of like pretend to pick things up from the street. Uh, you know, it's a folly, I suppose, in, in the sense. It's almost like the street and I are playing, um, um, like I'm picking up a piece of pleasure and taking it home. And I love that, that sort of the phone sort of said to me that, reminded me of this idea that, I, yeah, of course, Art is a space that urges us to be serious, and we need to be, but at the same time it dares or allows us to be tremendously foolish and childlike. Um, and it's almost like we can let go of our inhibitions. Um, another part of my practice that I do with both crossovers, and it's very important, um, this, is a, this is one of the works um, I'm working on, uh, a work, it's called Midnight in Pran, in which I'm documenting my suburb in Melbourne, which is most, mostly portraiture and um, sort of changing urban environments, and it's a, it's a kind of... Uh, um, but, so I'm doing these things within that, and I also see myself kind of repeating those patterns with the phone, where I have a very obsessive uh, streak to my practice, uh, which returns me to the same places and objects over and over and over and over and the more that I see them the more it gives me a kick somehow uh, and almost feels like I am the only witness to this because they're, they're always the same but they're never quite really the same right and so I am um, so this is one of those uh, so it has a lot to do with the quotidian time repetition um, I'm not going to play this, I was going to say, um, uh, because there's no audio and maybe it doesn't really matter, but this was a, uh, something that I did, like I collaborated a lot with, um, uh, again, um, actually musicians, uh, my friends, which most of my friends are musicians, actually I'm very lucky and uh, they inspire me, that's probably where most of my inspiration comes from. And um, So Tom, um, who, whose work I love and who's one of my closest friends, was making a, a new um, uh, he had made a new album and invited me to, to work together on, on a video and then none of us had any money, uh, there was no budget, you know, so like we went to the ocean um, and I just, uh, I mean, maybe I can play a second without the sound, well, I don't know, well, actually I don't think I can, sorry. Oh, on the, on the, on the, well, this is, yeah. I don't know, maybe I'll go. Wow, this is so weird. Sorry. Um, yeah, so we were just making this by the ocean with no budget, and it cost zero cents, of course, to make at the phone. Um, and I love that it's broken and a bit effed up, and it's sort of the quality is limited, and like all of that stuff kind of really works, and the song is about. Um, the or like the, the pain of uh, uh, having to um, uh, look at the mundane and having to do one's dishes when one has just um, found out from their partner over the phone that one needs to get a divorce. Uh, and, and so, anyway, um, um, so the phone is really just this. This thing to me, it, it has a lot to do with, um, and also in my other practice, I think a lot about this idea of um, what I mentioned earlier as well, a little bit like this, 
the, seeing what we've already seen um, and and how I think a lot about like how actually at the end of the day for me at least um, the banal only exists in my mind or in one's mind and it's sort of like with another kind of seeing everything is suddenly quivering and exquisite and absolutely strange and certainly very interesting um, and there can be this transformation that the known um, becomes unknown again um, and, and transformed into something else um, takes takes on a kind of sense of mystery almost through through this sort of re-seeing. So I feel like it's this totally incredible tool, right? Because you can look so closely and draw so closely to something, uh, something on the road or whatever it is that you're looking at, because it, because of its immediacy and its its sort of tiny form. It's this incredible tool that if we choose so, it allows us to reposition our, our hierarchical seeing patterns and uh, sort of allows a redetermination um, of, of uh, what is worthy of being seen and what is worthy of seeing and also what we see. So if you look at to me, it's like the stone at your doorstep that you had chosen to forget because you see it so many times a day uh, can suddenly become the, things that, the thing that greets you, your witness almost like your intimate, intimate collaborator in, um, in this very idea that you exist, actually. Um, also means to me that it sort of everything takes on a heightened state of urgency. Um, and nothing remains what you thought it was um, if you decide to look at it again properly. Um, also, I mean, this might sound a little bit weird. It's just stuff that I'm thinking, though, you know, like uh, stuff on my mind. But to me, it also denotes an act of liberation almost, because if the everyday is, is burdensome to you, which it is to many of us, I suppose, then this act of re-seeing transforms the already seen into theatrics, almost, right? A magical stage um, um, and a tiny piece of a grand act or something. So then this act of seeing on the periphery, um, this slow seeing is almost a mini revolution or rebellious because it no longer, it sort of means that if the, the, the sort of small minute thing that we deem unworthy suddenly becomes significant and an object of beauty to us, and then perhaps it means um, we might lose the, the sort of need or greed or desire for the very things that our regimes or corporations or societies dictate that we must strive to live, to live worthily for and to strive for and to see. Because in a way, when I think about it, I feel like we're constantly being dictated, um, you know, what it is that we must desire or see or look at, I suppose. So birdshit can suddenly be, I mean, birdshit can be birdshit, but birdshit could also be a work of abstract art or, or a universe. Um, you know, birdshit is birdshit, or it's an adaptation of Monk's scream, I suppose, to me at least, uh, you know. And I had this idea that I guess it's sort of like, ah, with the phone, and if you walk slowly, and so walking with me now usually takes a long time because, yeah, <laughs> it takes me ages to get from here to B because uh, there's so many things to see. But to the slow eye, the street offers an artwork for every occasion, almost. Um, and again, it's really not about what this picture looks like or, you know, it having to end up anywhere. That's not the purpose of it. The purpose is the actual act. Um, the being in, the idea of relation between myself and the world um, and the camera, this phone is the tool for it. Another thing that I love about it a lot uh, is, is um, and, and do a lot also, and I suppose we probably all do, is that it's so beautiful at, at sort of, um, you know, I mean, photography is of course all about the moment anyway, but the phone, I love how it sort of can make you kind of, it's fantastic for this idea of the scene, the small, the small scene. Um, because of its immediacy and intimacy, um, and it can hold this sort of transience of this smallest occasion in a way, um, which I see as a sort of lingering, almost more than a moment, because it's a bit bigger than just a, a, the click of an eye bat, but, you know, um, uh, so it's like, a, it's like a, t a, a sort of pause, which feels like a theatrical set again, almost surreal. Um, and what I find amazing when I think about the phone, it's, it's actually insane. To wrap one's head around this, but it's, of course it has, because the phone offers, a, or what it is, or what it has come to be, is that it's a globality, right? But at the same time, it's also an insane localizer. It acts as a total localizer in a sense. Like also, if you look at the kinds of pictures you know people make with their phones, it's sort of they're mostly about small, tiny things just around themselves. Now, so it's very interesting that it's this global tool, but it's it's really also an act of of localizing. Um, 
Uh, here's another small moment. Um, I always write with these kind of small moments or experiments or acts. Um, and that's also something that I've sort of uh, recently, and, and, and as going back to the title of the slug that I'm fitting into, this idea of the phone as an instigator, um, very much certainly the phone has definitely, that is something that I've taken from it, for example, into, into my other cameras again. Um, this idea of just really kind of a yearning also to return to a simplicity somehow, or strip it all back to essentials, um, and just be in something and see it and make a picture and see what this being in it feels like and what it might translate to and what it might touch. Um, and again, this idea of a small scene, um, just a small a sort of elongated pause. Um, here's another one example of that. So none of this stuff is actually, you know, my proper um, sort of my, my big projects. They're all just um, um, things uh, on the side. This is another scene. Um, I'm, I'm working on a really long thing in India, in Kolkata, and it's, a, it's about um, sort of mini ecologies and um, relation um, and community, and it's very interesting. And, and um, so while I'm there doing this other work, um, I had this moment uh, last year um, where, that I shared with a, with a group of five uh, um, boys and uh, didn't really understand each other. And uh, it was very much about, like, I just really wanted to make pictures there um, just in the moment and just to hold that very moment just for myself even. And, not, you know, it didn't have to go anywhere. There's no idea of an end product or anything like this. It was just very much about, about just being there. And I wrote um, a, a text with it, um, and which I will actually read out to you. If I, am I okay for time? Um, okay. Because, yeah, the, um, the, the, the idea of writing with these thoughts is really important to me. Um, <clears throat> Earth flies, heat swells and sweats and swallows. We don't need language as we have another. The ground is witnessed. Dry earth slips and spins. We throw the thing up in the air just after the dirt has filled it. It flies highly and low, hitting branches and insects and nothing at all. Dust and dirt and dust, here now and then. The thing that is our words, so as the ground she knows. When it flies, when it falls, it transcends. After the dance or during it, the sudden sky darkens, a tender splattering of matter over all. The trees are even older through the cloud of matter, clinging into being and onto the scene, aware of its imminent death, like I. We are in the presence of children. Will the flying earth, the one that is our witness, stay up there forever? Here in the up, everything belongs together. Face, shoe, tree, breath, earth, bird, nose, belt, eye, sun, stone. Time has died, just now, this moment of the flying earth, here, like glue. It only cares for what is instant. Our feet are running and hurling and twirling, twisted, not sleepy, but whole, deeply and dense and deranged, that these feet fly over and under the earth, the imminent earth, suddenly no longer in disguise. This is what it was always meant for. This right now, our feet and the heat and our hearts of sweaty dust. All other things are gone. The lake has disappeared. Our limbs are stomping, throwing, curving, swerving. I hear a bell somewhere, but time has truly left us. Some shoe flies, the sun swallows earth, ears and hands and stones and other things. A laughter crashes into birds. Birds swallow the sun. The raging shoe, our words are the thing that flies and falls and flies again. The dust, the heat, the earth, the other thing. We climb and cling and crinkle. Our arms fly with the earth around us are a thousand other animals. The animals see us and see, and time has truly left us. Um, and I think this is pretty much almost the last slide. Um, and uh, this is David and Anna. When we spoke last night um, about uh, the, how the phone is serious, but we all sort of use it as a kind of thing on the side almost or something like this. Um, I mean, we take it very seriously. We're all really interested, but it's also at the same time this other thing on the side somehow while one is on their way to the real thing or something, which is kind of strange, right? Um, but I find that really interesting. So it sort of means that it is actually an object uh, of the interim somehow, uh, or on the periphery, I don't know, a peripheral tool, I'm not sure. 
But this is another one of those kind of small experiments, this sort of just moments, the thing that I'm doing in between while I'm on my way to something else, and it's just about the act of walking and seeing and experimenting with this idea of like, how can I make pictures that feel like walking, um, feel like walk, what are the things that saw me, what am I seeing, I'm thinking of course, one of my great heroes, Rebecca Solnit, um, which probably, hopefully, a lot of you know, um, amazing thinker and writer, um, um, and she writes so elegantly and amazingly on this idea of uh, walking I mean, amongst many other ideas, of course. And she sort of argues how like, this act of walking is how we measure ourselves against Earth, which I love a lot. Um, um, and I think to me the act of walking is also, um, and I do it with all my practice, but it's also, it's almost like, and again going back to the obsession with the Gatwa too, but it's, it is a kind of walk, it's a, it's a sort of meeting place. When you think about the road, it is a sort of meeting place. It's almost like a little bit community engaged. I mean, all these things. I mean, um, you know, the other animals and I like, seeing each other. Um, and uh, I remember, like, I suppose when I was kind of growing up and at school, one of the books that stayed with me the most and was really influential to me back then, I read over and over and over and over. Um, uh, was by C.S. Nautical, and it's called Das Paradises Nehm an the Paradise Next Door, or maybe, or something like this. I don't know. I haven't read that in English. But it's brilliant because it's a sort of a semi fictional work in praise of the road or the act of walking, I suppose. And it's written in, it's not very thick, but it has like a thousand different languages in it, too, which I found really rebellious back then and which I loved because it was, um, it was kind of strange, uh, chaotic. Um, and sort of proposed this other world even just through the way that it was, you know, sort of using language um, and it was combusting and exploding a uh, space of chaos and dazzle and mess and perhaps sort of being truly human in that sense. Uh, and that is it, I think. You say that photography enables you to get closer to things. And I think on the other side, on the other part, this is also part of the power we see in your artwork, which is very powerful. So yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. You. Um, I would like to talk about the context of sharing also in your work. Sharing. Sharing. sharing yeah. Yeah. You, coming back to smart photography, and you have an Instagram account with more than 58,000 followers, which is really an extremely huge number. And Instagram claims the right to distribute your pictures and even sell them to a third party. And I think this is also an interesting question in your context. So how do you handle this? You know, I, it's, it's going to sound really dumb probably, but I never really think about that. Actually, I really don't. Um, and uh, it doesn't, it's not on my mind while I'm making pictures with the phone and putting them up on Instagram. It's also like, I suppose, I mean, uh, you know, it should be like that. It's wrong in a sense. Well, of course it is. But then it's also like, well, I'm still there to decide whether or not I want to use this tool or not. And I do want to use it because it's a, it actually denotes an offering for me personally. I find it a real space of offering. I find it exciting. I, I think we're living, I feel like we're in a really exciting point with the visual actually. Um, um, I don't see any of this as like a sort of threat or a, I just find it an offering because it means that things are happening and new things can emerge and it's very exciting I think. Uh, yeah, so I don't really, it doesn't really, I don't, I don't know, I suppose what can I do really, right? It's a new form of communication also. Yeah. yeah. So are there questions from the audience? Katrin, you were mentioning that um, uh, you enjoyed in the beginning when you when you started photographing with your iPhone the limitations of the iPhone. Mm -hmm. I think that is a very interesting aspect because um, uh, simply asking what is um, what was um, the win you were taking out of the limitation because that seems to me um, because uh, the win the win yeah well. Like, I mean, the, the, the pictures that I, that I, or like the video work that I, that is in the um, space of Zephyr, Julian, um, and the pictures, like, that, they're, they're all, like, they're all made with the three and the four, which were much more limited than the seven, so like now this kind of glowy stuff, for example, doesn't really work with this, the better the phone gets, it, you know, can't make it anymore, but, 
So what I'm winning, I suppose, is this idea that, uh, that so for example, very practically, that glow happened because that, you know, at that point the phone was so limited uh, in its capacity, uh, you know, and so if you were willing to push it, uh, kind of really like a ch chemical experiment, like a real, like an experiment, both into the into the darks or into the lights. If you're pushing it, you can literally watch it. And so therein was the win for me. It was like an offering that a picture was created that sort of was about a thing in the world, but that was suddenly no longer itself. Like it took because of the limitation of the medium, something became something other, right? So yeah, and, and that that felt like a win. Just even the, discovering that for myself was like wow. And what is happening right now, as the um, as the camera function in the smartphones is getting better and better, are you are you coming back to the world, and, and how does that affect? Still, I never left the world. I know, but your <laughs> but your images sometimes seem to to be out of this world. So, um, are your images coming back into um, our world, or um, are you trying to find other ways to to keep that spirit or moment or? or um, um, do you mean particularly about the glowy stuff? Mm, yeah, it's not only the glowy. It's it's there's a there seems to be a, a certain atmosphere in your images, which is somehow out of the world. It, it might be glowy. It, it might be because of the very strong contrast and so on. But if if the limitations of the, of the new iPhones are, are less, that means you have a higher possibility to to shoot right images, mm -hmm. which are correctly. Mm -hmm. um, is it happening that something of that spell is is getting lost, or are you helping yourself by other no, ways? No, I never. I mean, I know, um, I haven't really asked myself that before, actually. But also, I'm, I'm, I don't know. To be honest, it's yeah, it's not really something I think about whether whether or not um, I keep a spell or I just I'm, I'm just uh, I just commit to whatever it is that I'm sort of making and creating. And then, of course, I also for, for one like believe that for me the narrative also takes always takes precedence of this idea of the, 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 the idea of the idea, right? So like then I kind of go, okay, what, what is it that I'm trying to say? Um, and uh, how do I, what, you know, what, do, what is it that I'm trying to sort of give an audience or whatever? Um, and then therefore, what medium must I use to best do that? And how can I do that best? How can I do that justice? And it might mean, and of course, I can't perhaps in my mind talk about Chris's suicide or Tobias's death in the same way that I might talk about um, the street down the road or the, the, you know, there has to be different both approaches, methodologies, visualities, but also um, perhaps media as well, I think. Um, you know, and the phone, the, the work that you see here in the, in the space is very much uh, of its time. Like, I, I, can't, I can't make that now. Um, and I'm not interested anyway because that is what it is, and I think it has, it has, and I still stand totally behind it. Um, but you know, uh, I can't make that now because the phone has got better, um, and it doesn't. It doesn't interest. I wouldn't. I'm not interested to sit and go and make things glowy in Photoshop. But it has to work within in the camera, and the camera has to kind of uh, combust uh, and create that thing. So it's very much an object. On a, not a sort of a work of that particular time with those particular phones as well. I mean, I tried to make uh, those things with, I tried on my mem because I did think, ah, oh, shit, be awesome if I, like, I had this on film, right? Mm. And I tried some Mamiya and I tried all kinds of other cameras, the Hasselblad, and I mean, none of it was working because they're too good. That is too, this doesn't work. So it is very much embedded to that particular medium, that particular version of it also. Um, uh, and so, in that sense, I always move. No, I don't. I don't think. I don't think about. Am I keeping the spell? Or, uh, uh, I just think about what is it that I'm trying to do. How can I do that somehow? Uh. This, this is a good link to a general question. So, if smartphone photography initiates a new visual language, so um, this is past, and we will see what will come next. So, I, it's now my pleasure. So, if, if there are any any more questions, yeah. Um. Hi, Catherine. You, you mentioned the gutter, and that the gutter is an interesting way to think about humanity. Yeah. Um, when you've got an iPhone in your hand, you, you seem to look downwards more than you do 
when you've got your other cameras in your hand. You see, with your other cameras, you seem to look at things face on. Yeah. Straight ahead. Perhaps. Is there a connection for you between the, the smartphone and looking down? Yeah, definitely. I think, I, I think for sure. For me personally, I mean, I don't know about other people. And I do see it a lot also looking around at what other people do with it or even um, just people who don't aren't necessarily in photography. Uh, this act of like kind of like looking down and definitely you're right like I, th I think for sure I've done I sort of do that much more with the phone um, but also I think I do that much more with the phone because I, it also became a thing you know like it became a thing that this idea of uh, like making pictures of the glowing like the rubbish and with when the light was hitting it in the right way and then it would glow so it was the literal act of looking down became a part of the thing that I was sort of looking for I suppose um, uh, yeah but, that's definitely true. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> wanted to say that um, your photographs, I'm a big fan of Rebecca's as well. A field guide to getting lost is my Bible. Yeah. yeah. And I think your images are a perfect you know, illustration to oh, that thank you. Yeah, story. And so the map is not the territory, but in your case, you know, it's all this sort of imagined maps, really yeah. curious territories that shape in Mannheim is there. Thank you. That was not the question, but... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Could you elaborate a bit on why most of your work is in black and white and not in color? I find that super interesting and I want to know what, are the, what, what, what kind of thoughts play a role in that decision? What kind of what? Thoughts. What, what, thoughts. what, what kind of, of, of mindset mm -hmm. brought you to that decision to, to go for black and white instead of color? With the works at Tefia, for, for example? Well, most of what you should show here. Yeah, um, that's a. I mean, actually, there's a sort of uh, there's a difference between the work at Sophia and the work the work here because all of this stuff is uh, mostly. Oh, oh, I don't know. Um, sorry. Um, uh, newer and with other cameras, but the stuff at Sophia, for example, I was really kind of you know because I was very new or the phone was new in my life and I was testing it and I was I was literally just very interested in. Um, I didn't have I didn't have an agenda with it, you know, when I started making pictures with it, and so it was very much about like as I said, like testing the light, and so therefore I was thinking, okay, like in a sense, even though it's the iPhone, so it's it's the, it's our medium of the time, I suppose, but in in a sense also you can strip it right back and, and just look at the very basics, the fundamentals of photography, which is light and form and positioning, I suppose. Um, and so, you know, I kind of felt that that was particularly, I could do that in a much more poignant way, actually, in fact, when I was uh, uh, working with black and white. And of course that meant that because, you know, the phone doesn't make a black and white work. It makes a colour work and then you have to make a black and white in your phone, uh, you know. But that's how, I, that's why I suppose I felt uh, that it was, that it was responding to what I wanted from it. Uh, yeah. yeah. 